You're listening to the Two Guys and One Gun podcast here at Guns.com. What is going on, y'all? This is Alexander and Mr. Chris Eager with the Two Guys, One Gun podcast brought to you by Guns.com. We here at Guns.com are trying to be your one-stop shop for all your firearms needs. Today, we are going to get into pocket rockets, pocket pistols, small little baby guns designed to fit inside of the the pocket, you know, something easy to carry around, really revolutionized concealed carry, one of the first kind of concepts for concealed carry before it was a huge thing. Um, I'm just going to start off with my favorite pocket gun has to be the uh, Taurus Curve. A lot of people don't know this, but the curve will actually (laughs) curve the bullet too. Uh, Uh, anyways, uh, it's going to be one of those podcasts. It's going to be one of those for sure. Uh, I remember when the curve like first came out, I was working behind the gun counter at Cabela's and, uh, I, dude, at like five yards, the laser, which had no adjustment was so far, like to the left. We used to joke that like the curve will curve your bullet, wherever that laser is at, that, that's where that sucker is going. But, uh, anyways, pocket pistols date way back to the late 1800s, early 1900s. A lot of really cool designs, still extremely popular today. There's a lot of small frame firearms that are in production. In fact, we just got back from SHOT Show last month, and uh, Beretta has the new, what is it, the 30X, or is that what it is? Yeah, 30X, yeah. 30X, so there's brand new Tomcat Tomcat coming out. Still a popular thing, still a big big deal. So let's talk a little bit about the history, and I'm going to be honest with you, not my area of expertise, so I'm going to turn that one over to Mr. Eager here to to get us going. You don't have two or three different uh, pocket guns on you right now? You know, I don't. I have a couple on the wall. Uh, You know, I I don't... I, the the smallest one I think I have is uh it's actually my brother's but it's a uh, French ruby. Um, oh, pretty, rubies are very cool. Pretty cool. It's uh it's it's got waffen ops on it too, so it was an occupation made gun. Ru- rubies are um, very cool. Absolutely. But uh, anyway, pocket guns, uh, mouse guns. They don't necessarily have to be mouse guns, you know. But uh, yeah, what, it's, what it's the, one of the. What is the definition of a mouse gun? Like what is well okay 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 so let's address that um a, a mouse gun can actually. be a pocket gun and a pocket gun can be a mouse gun but they're not necessarily the same thing you okay. know um a, a pocket gun is simply just a gun small enough to put into a pocket and carry without someone looking at your pocket and being like you know oh is that a 357 magnum in your pocket or are you just happy to see me you know <laughs> but uh Generally, the, the kind of fast and loose modern description of a pocket gun is one that has a height under four inches, you know, that way it's not you know, so bulky to where you couldn't, you know, conceivably have it in a pocket. Um, and, and before we get too far into this conversation, I just want to point out that if you, you do have a pocket carry as your, your method of concealed carry, always do it with a holster. And that's the only way to safely pocket carriers with a pocket holster that keeps that uh, grip oriented to where you can can get right into it, get it up out of the uh, holster and get up on target. And w- if you drill with that for a little bit, it's amazingly fast. I've carried a, uh, a J-frame uh, snubby, like a, a 642 for literally decades like that in a pocket holster. And, you know, just when I go to the range, you know, and I usually go to the range about once a week, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the weather, you know, but, uh, Hey, if it's not raining, we ain't training. Right. But anyway, um, uh, I usually, you know, give it a go every time I I go to the range uh, along with my other stuff that I'm, I'm testing and evaluating that week. And you can get sub one second all the time. You know, if you, you, drill it out a little bit, come right up, pop, you know, right out of the pocket holster, right on target. It's super effective. Earth has a clip, so. (laughs) So, uh, pocket guns, all right. 
Uh, then you also have, you know, mouse guns and they like, again, they can be the same thing, but, you know, mouse gun is just kind of like a, a term of affection uh, for a, a pocket gun in a, a small caliber, uh, for instance, like a 32 or a 25 or a 22, uh, you know, something that you don't typically think of as being a self-defense caliber, which is these days, uh, with modern ammunition starting off at about uh, 30 super carry, 380 ACP, and, and going upwards, you know, uh, 38, 357. Uh, they, there's a couple of 40 pocket guns out there. Um, depends on how big your pocket is, right? But uh, I, I digress. So the history of them, I mean, they go way back, you know, to where you had really realistically the first handguns, you know, uh, they were so small because they were meant for, you know, a, a gentleman in the time of ruffians uh, to be able to carry something that wasn't uh, a sword. You know, uh, you look back at the, your very first uh, Smith & Wesson revolvers, the number one and stuff. It's a very small twenty two caliber uh revolver you know this meant you know for pocket carry you know in the carry of you know in your 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 jacket pocket you know or, or you know similar you know, vest pocket type of things um and then you even saw guns that were directly marketed uh like colt and fn were famous for this in the 1900s with uh john browning's early uh, auto loader designs like the 1900, 1903, and 1908. They had vest pocket models, you know. And they, if you go and pick up one of those Browning designs from that time period, the 1900, the 1903, 1908, you know, they feel incredibly modern even for today. And they were, you know, thought about 120, 130 years ago. And I mean, these are just you know they're melted they're so slim they're small you had models that were small enough to fit into a vest pocket because remember back then wrist watches weren't really a thing people had vests that they kept their pocket watch in and typically you would have a vest with two pockets in it so you could have your snazzy pocket watch in one hand and then your snazzy you know uh colt vest pocket in the other pocket what you know right so, you, you know, these, these early guns, you know, a lot of these early handguns, they were meant specifically for pocket carry. Um, and it, it's still a thing. You've got lots of people out there. You've got Galco, you've got DeSantis, um, you've got uh, uh, lots of different people making decent pocket holsters. Uh, you've got lots of people making decent pocket guns. Um, I would say that even Glock, you can look at a, a straight Glock uh, 42 or 43, and that can be carried in a pocket, you know, with the appropriate holster and, of course, the appropriate pocket. I mean, if you're wearing, like, skin-tight uh, yoga pants type, you know, you're probably not going to be able to do that. But, you know, if you're an older guy and have kind of baggy uh, uh, old beat-up uh, 550s or something on, you could carry a Glock 43 all day you know, in your pocket. So it's really, you know, beauty in the eye of the beholder type of thing. But it's, it's definitely a concept that is, is matured and it's still out there. It's one that has to be uh, evaluated. I mean, you wouldn't just walk into it cold. You're going to want to uh, practice and train with, a, with any sort of pocket gun. You're going to want to evaluate uh, what gun you're getting, make sure it's reliable because – a lot, I mean, if you're talking a gun that the height is a maximum of four inches, the slide, if it's an auto loader, isn't going to be very long, you know. So, people with low grip strength, they're not going to be able to rack that slide, you know. Uh, that's why you see a lot of these pocket pistols over the years, especially with Beretta, where they had the tip up barrel, like on your, your Minx and your Bobcat and your Tomcat, uh, those designs, you know, were. You know, since they had that that abbreviated slide, couldn't get a lot of grip on there to, to work that pretty stout recoil spring to keep the gun fairly uh, reliable. Uh, that's why they came up with those tip up barrels. So I mean, that's that's a development that you see primarily on your your pocket gun uh, size guns. So I mean, there's a lot of considerations to keep in mind with a pocket gun, and especially with a mouse gun. 
Um, but and, and it's a valid concept, and there's a lot of those guns out there. What Chris was trying to tell you about the big baggy pants thing was if, if you ever see him wearing cargo pants, he's pocket carrying a Glock 40 MOS. So, you know, just watch yourself. Uh, but no, yeah, there's a lot of really cool, and, and again, this kind of dates back to the the inception of uh, concealed carry, right? Like, for a long time, it was always open carry, look what I got. Um, there's an argument to be made that, you know, back then, there's kind of an inverse effect, right? There's, there's a lot of, uh, maybe I shouldn't act so stupid because everybody in here has guns kind of thing. But there's also a, uh, I have a gun so I can do whatever I want kind of thing that also... Uh, probably happened as well but especially in the early 1900s you see a uh, concealed carry become a lot more commonplace and uh the inception of, of having something that uh you know you don't people look at you and they don't see that you have that on you uh it's a huge advantage to you um but like you said there's there's a lot of complications a lot of designs that go into it However, some of the greatest minds in the gun industry started working on them, you know, uh, really early on. And, and some of the best designs that have survived all the way up until today uh, that we still see uh, come from some of the greatest gun designers like John Moses Browning. Along those lines, there are new um, firearms that are always coming out and there are new mouse guns, new pocket guns we just talked about the beretta 30x in fact we shot a competition with that at a beretta range day during a shot show this past year and there's some really good press on that in fact anything beretta related dave lou does a great job covering um but you can always stay up to date with what's new um new products new releases what's happening all the what's going on in the gun industry at guns.com backslash news. We've got a great uh, group of people here, super talented, love the firearms industry. Uh, they work very hard to bring everything that's going on to your computer screen, your phone screen, so that you can stay up to date because a well-informed, well-educated gun owner is the best gun owner. Um, when we talk about the modern concept of pocket guns, is it fair to say in the past maybe 10 years, not even less than that probably, uh, the extremely concealable handguns have kind of gone the way of the micro compact, which has a really high capacity. Uh, I think there's even an argument to be made that things like the OG P365 uh, can fit into the pocket gun. At least for me, I'm a big dude. I can easily throw a P365 in my pocket and it'd be fairly concealed. Uh, and that's 10, maybe even 12 rounds of capacity that you have available uh, right out of the right out of the old, you know, I wear yoga pants a lot. So right out of the old, you know, I'm just kidding, but you know, right out of the old pocket there. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's very valid. You know, uh, the, the modern micro compacts, you know, the uh, original uh, Hellcat, the original 365, uh, even, you know, less expensive guns like the Taurus uh, GX4, especially if you use the, the flush uh, bottom uh, magazines, not the Extendo mags, you know, to kind of bring that height because that's, you know, length is important, definitely. You know, that's what they keep telling. Is it? Me. Is it? But, uh, Damn it. it it's, it's height. <laughs> You know, that's the key on a pocket carry gun. You know, that four inches or less, that's when it really comes in handy, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the, uh, we're going to stop it right there. But uh, uh, when, you're, when you're looking at those specs, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's kind of your key uh, rule of thumb is that you want it to be as, as short as possible, obviously, and under four inches, you know, then – you want to have as few snag points as possible. That's why, like, particularly if you're going to go with a revolver, you want something uh, like a Smith & Wesson Centennial series. You know, that, that's, you know, flattened, doesn't have the exposed hammer, you know, stuff like that, because you have that big uh, hammer that comes out. You know, you got to think you're coming out of a pocket. You know, you could catch on the top of your uh, top of your pocket. It could stay in the pocket holster. And now you're going to pull a pocket holster off when you get it out, you know, or the whole uh, pocket 
degloves out of your pants with the pocket holster on it, and you're sitting there, you know, playing Krav Maga with your own gun, trying to get it out, you know. So it's definitely something you want to practice before you use it type of thing. And, and all concealed carry is like that. But, you know, there's a, a steeper learning curve with pocket carry because you're uh, you're not just drawn from concealment, like if you're carrying an appendix or at three o'clock or something, or with a, a outside the waistband and a cover garment or something. But if you're you're doing a pocket carry, that's more of a, a a pro move. You know, that's that's somebody who's done this for a minute. You know, it's, it's generally not somebody who just picked up their first handgun today, and this is the first time they're carrying it and they shoved it in their pocket. You know, that's probably not the path to success on that. You know, you definitely want to want to train with an empty unloaded uh, gun at home until you're you're very, very, very comfortable with your draw. And then, you know, graduate to the uh, snap caps and graduate to the range and, you know, put it all together and, and make sure it works for you, you know, before you just buy a gun and toss it in your pocket. You know, you definitely want to get in touch with your your holster and uh, make sure you've got all the things. And uh, there's no shame in seeking training. You know, there's, there's lots of, you know, self-training methods out there, but there's no shame in, you know, checking with your local gun club or gun shop and, you know, hey, somebody gets classes and this stuff, you know, and, you know, talking with them and hanging out with them for a while, you know. Your femoral artery is right there, so it's always advantageous to not nick that. So definitely want to train. Um, like you said, it's, that's the most important thing when it doesn't matter what we're talking about, doesn't matter what the subject is. Uh, you know, I, I try to kind of end all of my reviews and all of my, uh, articles with the, the most important thing is always training. It doesn't matter if you decide that you're going to conceal carry or appendix carry a Glock 19, or you're going to, you know, appendix carry or not appendix, but if you're going to pocket carry a, a 22 Magnum. You know, if you don't take the time to train, go to the range, spend the time mastering the craft, you know, working it out. Uh, I would much rather, I've, I've said this multiple times, you know, there's there's things that objectively are obviously better suited at, at certain tasks than other designs. But I would rather have somebody who trains on a, a 22 Magnum um, than somebody who has never fired a shot out of their clock 19 and, and they appendix carry it, right? Like I would rather be with the person who spends the time at the range uh, and, and I trust them more. So no matter what it is, we should always be hitting the range uh, and, and training and dry firing too. That's another thing. You should always be working your dry fire. Um, it's a perishable skill. It's something that you can always work in. Um, there's some great companies out there like Mantis. Uh, you can get all kinds of cool things that will help you train. Um, but you should definitely get in some dry fire time as well. Uh, just as a small anecdote, my one of my favorite moments working in the warehouse when I used to work in the warehouse here was a guy bought one of those North American arms uh Little, I mean, like that big, like freaking twenty-two revolvers. Those you know, things are fun. What, I, what's the? I don't know what the model name of that is. It's uh, it's the NAA mini revolver. Mini revolver, yeah, that's what it yeah, is. They have a whole series of them. They have got like twenty-two but, shorts, twenty-two longs, twenty-two right. magnums. You know, this guy bought the twenty-two LR. Must have been like maybe that big. You know, and it's this tiny little folds up into the grip, and he bought a Smith and Wesson five hundred. So I was just like, oh. that's the greatest, like. I'm gonna have the smallest revolver possible, and then I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna also like have somebody to have, buys like a Fiat and a Ford F three fifty. Right. I'm and also have to have wrist surgery. In three nothing years. in between. Yeah. That's the only. Uh, that's like one of the only guns that if I'm I'm at a range and somebody's like, "Hey, you want to shoot a couple rounds?" I'm like, "I'm good. I've done that. That was fun. The time that I did it, I don't really want to do it again." Um. But no, there's there's so many cool little like those little tiny revolvers. It's pretty incredible how small they are. You know, and they like I said, they fold up into the grip, uh, so it kind of keeps the action protected and everything. Uh, very very interesting. Um, obviously, I wouldn't necessarily recommend walking around with a twenty two LR for your self defense, but. You know, it's it's still it's still an option, and if you train with it, well, it's, it can be effective. You know, and 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 that's also a thing with uh, particularly mouse guns. You know, there's there's 
lots of guys who are mouse gun collectors. I had, I had, a, I've got a friend who's collected them for years. He's got dozens of the things. He's got old, you know, Remington Derringers and Butler Derringers and stuff, and those those crappy uh, Davis Derringers and all the little mini revolvers. And he's got some of those. Uh, gosh, I forget what you call them. The little Lilliputian revolvers that come from like Austria that are. They look almost like you could put them on a keychain or they're a whistle or something, you know, but like they actually fire like a little pinfire around, like a four millimeter pinfire around. He, he's got some of those. And so, I mean, it's, there's an actual collectability to, uh, you know, these little mouse guns, you know, and uh, uh, particularly when you look at the the older, uh, like your, your, we were talking about the Colt vest pockets and stuff like that and the uh, the Browning baby. If you ever looked at the Browning Baby, the little twenty-five caliber Browning Baby, some of those things are downright cute. You know, they they had them with like mother of pearl grips and chrome and nickel and all sorts of stuff. I mean, they were, you know, it's like, well, that's a that's a sweet little gun. You know, and they had they sold them a little patent leather case. You know, and and a lot of times you still find them. You know, with that same patent leather case, and it hasn't flaked all off yet. You know, and it's still a nice nickel finish or chrome finish or whatever, you know, some exotic, you know, Coca Bolo grip on it, and it's it's a cool little gun, you know. Sick kind of does the same thing with the the two thirty eight, the nine thirty eight. You know, you still kind of they got those sapphire finishes and all those cute little pretty, you know, and they come with the little I don't know Kydex holsters and stuff. They're kind of cool. I guess that's probably also a. Uh, in in the running for uh for a pocket gun as well um but if you're ever looking for a pocket gun maybe you've got like a big old glock 40 mos like chris likes to conceal carry in his uh pocket on his cargo pants and you want to trade that in for a baby browning you can do that at guns.com uh, we have a program called the we buy guns program where uh, you can submit a picture a little bit of information we'll send you an offer virtually if you like that offer we'll send you everything that you need to ship that gun to us we'll pay you either direct deposit or through a check um, and I think it's coming in the works where uh, there'll be a, a separate offer where you can get it in um, gift cards so you can turn right back around and get something at guns.com, kind of a, a up to trade in value uh, and maybe change up that concealed carry, go to a, to a pocket gun. There's a huge selection of firearms through thousands of FFLs across the United States, all in one spot, and that is at guns.com. Um, that's also one of the things that, you know, I think a lot of people, because of 380, 9mm, 357, 40, all that, it's really easy to forget about all of the other calibers that exist, right? It's, I mean, you could pretty much just from anywhere, you could throw out a number from like 20 up to 45, and if you just throw ACP behind it, it probably exists as a caliber, right? So there's so many, just those those tiny little, um, you know, like you said, mouse gun calibers or, or pocket calibers that are out there. And a lot of people still run with them. You know, they still use them. Some of them are in, in production. Outside of the United States, there's a lot of nations that don't allow you to own popular military cartridges, right? Um, one of the reasons why things like 30 Super Carry exists our 38 super exists so things like 25 32 that's the go-to uh, caliber in mexico is 38 super carry absolutely because and, and because like nine millimeters just for the military just for the know. military yeah and so there's there's a lot of places where you know 32 25 um things of that nature tend to thrive a little bit more than maybe the united states but that's not to say that it's not popular here as well also i think it's super cool you get one of those little they they do the tomcat bobcats with the threaded barrels now you throw on a can with a 25 or a 32. um there used to be uh i, I worked once with uh it was a polish grom i think and they during the height of oef they would uh, have their smallest guys put on like burkas and uh, they would go into these tea houses where they knew particular folks who were making IDs and such of that nature would hang out. 
and uh, they would take those little baby mouse guns and they were threaded through cans on there, either 22 Magnum or something like 32, 25. And they go into these uh, tea houses, get in one of the private booths and, you know, and uh, makes no noise. And then you get to just walk out. So uh, it's, it's something that I, uh, I like some of the Grom guys that I, I worked with previously and had talked about. So there's even military applications that, uh, that these small little baby guns, pocket guns, have uh, have come into use with. I cannot remember the exact models that they were using, but I'm like 90% sure they were Berettas, uh, but I can't remember because I think they, they, they had the threaded barrels and everything. But anyways, uh, there's even some, like I said, even some kind of cool military use that uh, that some of those guns Well, have seen. you know, the, the Israeli Mossad and, and their air oh, yeah. marshals and stuff, you know, they carried the, uh, or they used, like, not just carried, but there's a lot of actual, like, field use of uh, Beretta 22s, like your 71 model Berettas, the Jaguar, you know, the uh, little, you know, svelte little 22 uh, pistol, you know, that was used extensively, you know, especially after uh, Munich and 72 and stuff, you know, so. Wasn't there a Smith & Wesson, I could be wrong, wasn't there a Smith & Wesson like pocket revolver that was specifically made for the air marshals and the caliber was like a specific 22 caliber that wasn't supposed to penetrate like the hull of the plane so they wouldn't depressurize the plane if they had to fire inside i feel like there's a forgotten weapons video on that but i don't know well and, and this is probably the subject for a whole nother uh deal but smith and wesson actually developed a like a, a special purpose revolver for the tunnel rats in uh, Vietnam, and it was like flashless, you know, suppressed without a suppressor, you know, fired a special round, you know, um, and and that's like a whole deal, you know. There wasn't very many of them made. It was it was more or less an experimental, you know, type of project. Um, but there was stuff like that out there for sure, you know. And but you know, Never heard that talking about Smith and Wesson pocket guns, they made the they also made the Smith and Wesson Model sixty one, which is a little tiny. Like just bigger than a matchbook sized uh, twenty two that they had around for a long time. They 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 weren't very good guns. They weren't very reliable, but they they worked. You know, sometimes you get that first shot off. Anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, so they were popular. Like the sixty one, uh, the, the original sixty one wasn't uh, very reliable, but like the sixty one dash two was was a little bit more reliable. You know, so that's the one that people are always looking for. Uh, it's a very collectible gun, you know. They hadn't made it since the seventies, you know, but because uh, because that kind of was, uh, it was a big bit in after sixty eight when they had the uh, they started doing all the uh, import bans on very small pistols. That's why you saw like the Walther PPK had to be made in by Smith and Wesson, you know, at the, at that time, and uh, all those little tiny like the FIE Titans and stuff stopped coming in from uh, Italy and the little ROMs uh, started coming in from Germany um, because they started making them in the United States because they, they were banned from import. They didn't uh, pass the, the sporting purposes test for handguns, uh, which that, that's still a boogaboo. That's still a thing that's out there. That's why you can't get very small pistols and revolvers made overseas imported to the United States. That's why like the uh, most of the uh, Glock 380s uh, we're kind of verboten for uh, commercial sales here. You could buy them, oddly enough, as a law enforcement customer, but you couldn't buy them uh, as a consumer. You know, that's why they started making the Model 42 over here. Uh, so, you know, you could get it, you know. But you know, that's, a, that's a little, you know, getting into the weeds. On that's that, a, yeah, that's another, another podcast. We'll have to, we get in, sometimes it's pretty crazy, we get in some of the Taurus 805s, which are supposed to have two-inch barrels, and they're imported with three and a half inch barrels and they have a little excess that has to be cut off and then recrowned. And we'll get them every now and then where the excess hasn't been cut off and, and recrowned. I think Mr. Ian McCollum uh, found one when he was in the warehouse a couple weeks ago and he's doing a, a video on one of those. So that's kind of cool. But anyways, that's another another subject for another time. Um, that has kind of been a, a good overview of pocket pistols, pocket revolvers, mouse guns. 
uh, all kinds of cool things. There's some really great articles out there on guns.com. I believe there's some things in the works even with uh, with Paul uh, Peterson. He's got a couple of cool articles that I think are up and coming and a few that he's already published on things like 25 ACP, 32, um, some of those small guns, which are pretty awesome to check out. If you ever get a chance to shoot one, you should definitely like take it up. It's just so easy. You know, there's no recoil. You just sit there and plink with it. Um, but I think that pretty much does it for the subject today. Uh, this has been a, a solid discussion. Be sure to get down in the comments. Let us know what you guys think about the mouse gun, the pocket gun, if you like it, what your favorite one is, what some of your favorite calibers. Um, you know, and you know, be sure to judge us on things like whatever. Uh, my hair or the fact that uh, you know, Chris likes to pocket carry a Glock 40 MOS in his uh, cargo pants. So I'm just gonna start that rumor. Uh, but that does it for today's episode of Two Guys, One Gun, brought to you by Guns.com. Um, for Alexander and my co-host here, Mr. Eager, we'll catch you guys on the next episode.